name is Ron Evans, known as Dead Program. That's my more important identity. I work at the Hybrid Group in Los Angeles. We're one of the sponsors of the conference. Check out our new freemium product, Kanban Pad. Service announcement over. But I'm not here to talk about that today. I'm here to talk about music. It is a language that we all understand because it's a world all into itself. At least that's what Stevie Wonder said in one of his most famous songs, and that lyric has always stuck with me. It's like he was talking about software development at the same time that he was talking about music. And music really is a symbolic language, isn't it? We have pauses and the presence of frequency, which are either rests or notes. We combine those things together to create chords, or if we play them in a sequence, they create a scale. We combine those elements together and we can have measures and rests, and so even the most complex music ever written can be represented using this symbolic language. So now we know everything we need to know to make music. That's it. It's a very short session, right? Well, wait a second. That's kind of bogus, isn't it? Because music is not just about the theory of music, it's also about the practice of music, actually doing it. You can't learn to play music simply by reading a book about it, any more than you can learn to do software development by reading a book about programming. And so, if you want to play in a band, you need to practice together in a band. If you want to develop software in a group, you need to do some group software development. So, let's talk about the structure of a, of a song. And let's see if we can compare this to some of the things that we need to do when developing software. First of all, if you're going to jam together with your band, you need to have a set list which is a list of all the different songs that you're going to play, one of the important rules is you can't jam together unless at least two people in the band know the same song. Right? Because nobody knows what they're talking about. It's also critical to choose the correct key of music. Because the relationships in music are relative, two people can be playing the exact same song in different keys and it just does not synchronize. So you need to decide before you're going to start playing the song, what key are you going to play that song in. Then. The drummer is going to start counting it off. The drummer is responsible for setting the tempo, not the rhythm. So here's your friendly drummer. He counts off, and boom, we get going. We got the bass player. He's going to lay down the foundation. The bass player creates the groove. The bass player is not responsible for anything else other than this. People typically think it's the drummer. So we get going. Now the singer comes in. It's really important to have not just a melody, but also lyrics. That's what makes one song different from another, because many songs have exactly the same chord changes, right? The same way that many software applications have a similar intended purpose, but they're totally different. Then the soloists start coming in. Once we've created this foundation, once we've created the basis, then we can start adding things on top to make it unique and different. And everybody's jamming along. The song is going great. Now what do we do? It's time to end it. It's time to finish up. We need to make eye contact. We need to use body language because music is not simply something that you do by listening. It's something that's a product of all of your senses. Starting to see the parallels? So time to end the song. We look at each other. Sometimes that's not enough. You need to do something a lot more dramatic. You need to really, hey, guys, over here. I'm going to end the song. That's it. Right? So we're coming to the end of the song. The most important thing is to look to a leader in the band. And it doesn't have to be the singer in the band. And it's not necessarily the person in charge of the band, but it's simply somebody who is the person that everyone else looks to, to decide, this is the synchronization point. This is the person who is going to tell us when we reach the points where we need to be. Right? So let's talk about style. We played the song. That was really cool. Well, music starts out in a very formalized way. There's a special class of people who play music. It's not something that's generally available to the public in general. Most of the music from the early days of music are songs that have been entirely forgotten because they weren't considered important enough to document. So a uh, parallel to this might be IBM 370 assembler code. Right? You see that it's both a combination of highly structured as well as sort of seemingly superfluous things that are in there that if you don't know what it means, you simply can't do it. So the music continues to evolve. It goes away from simply being a product of a special class of unique, wealthy individuals, and it becomes more popularized. But at the same time, it's highly formalized and structured. The music of a marching band like that of John Philip Sousa had to have a certain kind of structure. We might see a parallel in a language like Cobalt, where 
There's enormous structure. Without this structure, you simply cannot do anything. So music continues to evolve, and we enter the jazz era. Suddenly now, individual accomplishment becomes equally important as group cohesiveness. And a great example of a programming language that implements this might be Algol, where you see the simplicity is starting to form. You start to see a structure coming which strips out a lot of the other elements, which may be Baroque or ornamentative. And you start seeing the purpose of the code coming out. So then we come to the rock era. Anybody know who this band is? This is a group, the Grateful Dead. Now the Grateful Dead are an incredibly important band in the annals of music, but more importantly, they, this band, this guy Jerry Garcia, is probably the greatest marketing genius in the history of music. They actually created the freemium business model. They would do performances and they would let anybody record the music and you could sell the bootleg tapes or trade them. They didn't care. They made all their money off of touring. When more famous bands like the Rolling Stone were deeply indebted to record companies, aka VCs, the Grateful Dead were able to control their own destinies. They owned the rights to all their own material. Furthermore, an entire economic ecosystem was created around them. People who followed the band, the parking lot, people selling different things to each other, a participatory experience, they had literally created a whole micro-economy right around their freemium model that they had created. An example might be Lisp, the hippie language. <laughs> right, you see, again, you're starting to see structure forming. You're starting to see a simplicity. But at the same time, the intent is coming through. It's being more accurately communicated. So then we come to the modern era. So nowadays, music is not simply one style. It's typical to mash up different styles, to combine different elements. And we see that the music industry itself is transformed from something that's very top-down and hierarchical to where independent artists are able to create their own information product and sell it directly to interested consumers, bypassing the traditional distribution mechanisms. Starting to see the parallel, folks? And Ruby is emblematic of this new era. We see that it's literally stripped it down to its most pure and core elements. The intent is right here. We have not added anything extra. We've gotten rid of all ornamentation. We've gotten right down to the music. So let's talk about instrumentation and how that might apply. Solo artists. Very, very rare that we see successful software products come from solo artists. For every desktop tower defense, there are millions of microproducts which really never see the light of day and don't have any significant economic benefit to their creator. It is possible to do this, just like it's possible to be a prince and record your entire album yourself playing all the instruments. It's more common, though, to find duos. The duet is a beautiful form of music, and the duo is an amazing form to create companies. The two speeds, Larry and Sergey. We've seen a lot of monumental successes, really remarkable, in the interplay between two people. But what about trios? Those are pretty fun too. There have been some successful trios. Jason Fried wrote a blog post, I believe it was last year, where he posited that the ideal and most optimum organization for a startup company would be three people. The business guy, the developer, and the designer. And that by complementing each other's strengths, you could create something that was significantly more powerful than individually. And then we get into combos. You might see the combo is something akin to a consultancy or a boutique firm. You've got a variety of different instruments or different techniques of different players, and each of them interplays, combining their elements to create something that is more complex than anything that could be created by individuals or trio or duets. And then we have orchestras. The more complex, the more difficult, the more regimented, the more hierarchical, Right? Or wrong. There might be other examples of larger groups which are able to participate together, which take a non-hierarchical distributed format. An example of this might be Linux itself. There is a single director with Linus, but there are thousands of contributors who are all working together in their own different ways, but they all have a single point of synchronization. You guys remember this band? Extra Action Marching Band? They were mentioned in the keynote earlier. 
data itself. So let's talk about a few musical anti-patterns and how those might apply to software development. Well, musicians are often faking it. They're doing things that they do not know what they are doing. But they sound great. How do they pull this off? It's because musicians have design patterns that they refer to. This is called a fake book. And it's literally sometimes, it's literally over a thousand songs, some of which are blues in E. Right? Very, very simple. But this is how musicians will get together and will be able to play songs that they seem to know every single song. How do these guys do it? They're faking it because they know design patterns. But trying to do it all by yourself, trying to be the source of all knowledge, you can appear a little ridiculous, right? There's just no way you can pull it off. You can't do it all at the same time with just one person. You need to know when to ask for help. And when something's not working, stop. <laughs> Please. Recognize that there's some fundamental incompatibilities and call it a day. Because some groups are entirely unique. What they're doing is completely indescribable. No one else could possibly join. Some companies are cliques that if you don't understand their culture, some teams, you can't get in because what they're doing is freeform jazz odyssey and EDM. If you don't understand that, you're just not in the band. And remember, leave some space for other people. It's not all just about you. Don't hog all the oxygen in the room. Come on, you need to share. You need to spread the love. Because otherwise, you're going to find yourself with your massive ego all by yourself, frankly, doing something that people are losing interest in by the day. So now that we've gotten a basis of theory, we've now entered the practice session. We are now going to do some practice. So I'm going to ask you all to have a little experiment with me. Please put your laptops away. Please put your cell phones down. And everybody who's in the back, please come up to the front. Come on, don't be scared, I won't bite much. Come on, right, you guys have to come. We have to make a consolidated group of people for this to actually work. I saw this amazing thing last year in Canada from the extraordinary Misha Globerman. And it was so impressive that it stuck with me. And I tried it in Mexico last month, and it was, it was really great. So if you guys are willing to give up your disbelief for a brief moment, let's all get together. Now, you can, you can all just be together. We sit there. There's no sitting. The next thing is everybody stand up. There's no sitting. All right. Come on, keep going. This is great. All right, we are going to have this experiment. We're going to start by learning a musical vocabulary. Okay, we're going to use a sonic language, and the, we're going to learn this all collectively, and then we're going to start doing some things with it. So the first sound is going to be a vocal sound, uh, sorry, a vowel sound. So it could be ah, it could be o, oh, it could be oo. It could change. Look, we're going to do it together in a minute, but it could be like ah, oh. Anything like that. You can let your own individual creativity come out, but we're all going to do it together at the same time. All right? On the four. One, two, three. Oh. 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 Very nice, very nice. All right, the second, the second symbol in our musical vocabulary is going to be a very light kind of hand clapping, like golf clapping. Now you can do it in rhythms, you can have a little clobbing, you know, you can do it constantly, you can kind of move it around, cup your hands, you can experiment with anything you want. The trick is to make sure it's not too loud, so not full clapping. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. On the count of four. One, two, three. <laughs> All right, very good. All right. So now the third symbol in our musical vocabulary is going to be a sibilant sound. It could be a shh, or it could be a s, or it could be going in between, kind of a shh, brave and dead sort of thing, right? So let's all do this together on the count of four. One, two, three, All right, excellent. Now we've learned our basic musical vocabulary. All right, so now we're going to play a little game that I first learned with spatulas, but we're going to do it with uh, flags today. So let's see, we'll start with you, Tom. 
Uh, you're going to be in charge of the vowel sound. Yes. All right. And uh, let's go back over here. The pirate flag is going to be the clapping sound. And then the sibilant for the saints. Uh, we'll start that one. Better not go that way. Let's start that one over here. Oh, sorry. I warned you about this. Um, we got to be more centralized. You, sir. You, good sir. Excellent. Thank you, Mario. All right. So this is what we're going to do. Each of you have your individual flags. You know your starting musical symbol. If you are directly around the person, everybody hold your flag up. All right. If you are directly around that person, you're going to make the same sound as them. All right. If you are not directly around the person, make no sound. If you are holding a flag, pass the flag after about maybe 20 seconds maximum to the next person. The idea is to keep it moving around. All right, so you guys follow this? If you're near that sound, make the sound. If you're not near any sound, make no sound. How near? Just direct proximity only. Right. Who's using the sound? The person, he's in charge of the vowel sound, starting. The pirate flag is the clapping sound. And the saint's flag is the sibilant. All right, we're going to start this on the count of four. One, two, three. Pass it. Pass it, man. Keep it up. Pass it. Pass it. Keep it moving.
If two people next to you, uh, sorry, if, if two people next to the person, if you're next to these two people, let's say uh, Tom and you, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but, but thank you. Okay, you guys are going to do the bottle. All right, let's start the same as, or who was it, where were you guys doing last? You were clapping. You were clapping, just keep clapping. All right, so you two are going to start. Where's my bottle? Who's the bottle? Does anyone know who the bottle is? Oh, the ball got lost. Okay, well then let's pick a person. <laughs> let's pick some people. Let's see. A random person is, uh, we need to, uh, how about you two right here are going to be the zoo bottle. All right? Great. And then uh, our sibilant. Where was our sibilant? Okay, you guys, are, you two are going to be the sibilants. All right, this is great. So now, back to the rules of our game. If you, two people next to them, are, if you're next to two people doing it, Whatever the sound is, start doing it. If you're surrounded by people doing the same sound, stop. All right? If nobody next to you is making any sound, don't do anything. Wait for it to come to you. All right? What happens if you have to do two sounds at the same time? You will have to, as a cellular automaton, decide exactly which one of these you're going to gravitate towards. <laughs> I trust you. All right. Are we ready for Conway's Game of Life? Done entirely using sound. Yes. yes. And that wasn't loud enough. Yes. All right. On the count of four. Oh, we have a question. I don't know. Let's find out. Your cellular automatons. You guys should be able to just do this. All right. Are we ready? On the count of four. One, two, three, four. Right? Design patterns, 
learn about other languages, and practice together, study together, read code together, learn code together, collaborate with other people on code. Practice yourself. You can't just go in and jam with a band if you haven't done individual practice. There's no way you can go in and jam and code if you haven't really worked on your own individual program shops. And then you have to bring the band together. And it doesn't matter the kind of music you're playing. It doesn't have to be a professional setting or a professional gig. What matters is that you're coming together collectively to share these ideas and something amazing might come out of it, like Tom said during his talk. Because Improvised music is where some of the greatest music in history has come from. Likewise, improvised code has created some of the most amazing services that we all use, something that was created you know, one night at a bar, or maybe over a weekend at a startup camp. Because it's really about creating the scenario whereby this improvisation can occur, creating the conditions, creating that state of flow, both individually and collectively. Thank you very much. Go out there and do it.